Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this session on advancing the fifth industrial revolution. We are a part of Horasis and we are here to discuss how the world is changing, how people in the common sectors have to benefit from this change and how the common man and every individual in the world should be part of this new 5IR, which is the fifth industrial revolution. And because of technology, it is possible to bridge the gap, a digital divide, all kinds of divides. It is possible to do things which were not done before. We are talking at a Horasis India conference, so it is relevant to say that India missed the industrial revolution and India missed the manufacturing sector wave. India has done well in the services sector over the last few decades, especially information technology has driven India ahead. Software exports have been propelled to high levels. Employment has also benefited. However, it is important for India to leverage the growth that is taking place, make it equitable, and make sure that every Ram and every Nina in every village is looking to benefit from the industrial revolution. And also it is important that the government, the industry, the education sector, and all stakeholders come together so that they can actually make sure that it is not only a few individuals or a few conglomerates or organizations that benefit. We have a very, very distinguished panel today, and I'm a very uh, proud moderator, chairman of this session. I have uh, with me to start off Sridhar, who is based in Hyderabad, who is leading technology, and who is also going to talk about how COVID has impacted the world and how we need to move forward. So I'll be introducing each of the speakers as they speak. Over to you for now, Sridhar. Thank you, Rick. Good morning, everyone. I feel honored to speak to all of you today. So I'll be speaking on the role of fifth industrial revolution in pathogenic COVID-19. As Vivek mentioned, I'm a technologist. We built a command control platform for urban infrastructure, critical infrastructure. How do you make infrastructure smart so that you can serve citizens better and you can provide optimization? But all over the world, when you're serving the cities or when you're serving the community, globally, the focus was in six verticals, lighting, parking, waste, traffic, safety, safety and environment. There was not much of digitization is done on health crisis. So when this COVID-19 happened, uh, Kunal Kumar, who is a joint secretary for the smart city mission at India level, he called me and said that by then we were doing 60% of the cities run on our platform. So he called me and said that, hey, the command <laughs> platform, what you have, can you repurpose and build a you know, CCC platform for cities, sorry, for, for COVID-19. So we took within 24 hours, along with the partners, put together the entire platform to fight against COVID. So it does three things. One, how do you manage these cases so that you'll have, you'll avoid the future cases, you can monitor all the cases very, very carefully, and you can provide better health infrastructure based on the predictions, based on where number of cases are high. To do that, as a command control center platform, we have integrated different kinds of different departments which were working on silos. For example, health department in India, which manages the actual active patients, what are the hospitals available, where are all the quarantine centers available, what are the test results by city, by each region. Then the police was also playing a major role in terms of containment zones. Wherever there are less, more number of cases, creating a containment zone so that not many people will have access to it and more stricter restrictions there. And based on the access to the people, based on the, how the people are moving, so you'll be able to gauge where more number of cases are coming versus where less. Then from the social welfare department, so some of you, you know, most of you are from India, so migrant labor was the biggest problem in India, right? So where lots of people moving from cities to their hometowns, when they are moving from different places, there is a huge amount of, you know, pause, you know, the COVID cases. So how do you make sure that how the uh, migrant labor is affecting the COVID cases? And then how do you plan? 
including their food and supply at the same time how it's affecting in our do you plan so what i'm plan to say is we have done this for india in a very short time and as around 40 cities in india implementing this technology right now but in the future this will become a huge use case not just as a covid 19 as a crisis management use case <laughs> natural disasters or it could be industrial disasters like pandemic or floods or earthquakes industrial disaster disaster like gas leaks or oil leaks so this will become very very proactive and predictive will be able to control much much faster than before we are happy to be part of it thank you thank you shridhar that was a very good opening statement and thank you for sticking to the time as well and now we have thomas wu who is based in germany at the moment and switzerland at most times and he is into high end research and uh, encouraging a lot of research in covid as well and thomas has a large amount of experience in the field and other sectors he has uh, served a lot and gnic is his organization so go ahead thomas thank you so much and uh, it's really a pleasure to be on the panel today and uh, i can um, only confirm that covid-19 is really changing the world and it's changing the mindset and uh, one of the major areas where we do our investments and uh, bring in industri- uh, sustainable industrialization are the developing countries and we see some interesting phenomena in particular in africa Uh, where we invest a lot these days um covid-19 actually united the continent yeah uh, due to the fact that the africans uh, were always let's say last in the queue when it came to ppe products when it came to tests when it came to healthcare products to fight the pandemic um they quickly organized actually a so they call it private sector initiative for covid-19 So I have never seen that you know all the major entrepreneurs of Africa put themselves together with the governments and um, made a fantastic uh, uh, action plan to invest in Africa in production in Africa and we must not forget that due to the uh, um, new contracts of last year Africa is becoming one of the biggest free markets worldwide and the cross continental trade in africa will increase significantly so we have these two effects that we have a free market in africa uh, we have this boost by the private industry uh, committing themselves to support the continent and a completely new market is developing particularly in the healthcare sector this is i think from my point of view also a fantastic opportunity for india since india is basically is a workbench for the pharmaceutical industry worldwide and the african market is a huge market in that respect uh, and with localization in africa indian companies will have a very prosperous future from my point of view we see this we invest by ourselves in uh, covid-19 test production in ghana uh, we set up mass production in south africa and tunisia uh, and uh, we are setting up another Uh, factory now to uh, build uh, mobile laboratories in africa so that these laboratories could be distributed next to our healthcare sector we um, invest in a lot in sustainability in new um, uh, mobility concepts and even there india is one of our benchmarks how you develop biogas how you use your natural resources but even your resources we call it waste yeah waste is not waste for us it's a natural resource and he uses waste in order to produce energy i think this is a perfect perfect sample for africa uh, i'm not a believer in immobility in africa since even today over 90 uh, over 74% of the energy is produced by fossil fuels and only 40% of the africans have access to electricity yeah right. but i think Uh, particularly with synthetic fuels this will be the future this will be the future for biogas and africa and india can be the benchmark for the developing and developed world in order to use these resources effectively to uh, reduce co2 output yeah particularly in africa where you see over 50% of the co2 comes from mobility and when we use this source and with indian technology it's going to be fantastic yeah 
And um, the other thing where India can closely cooperate in, in Africa, and this is the third field where we invest significantly, is in new uh, um, advanced agriculture. You know, most of the seeds we are using in our uh, advanced agricultural investments are coming actually from India or are developed from India. Yeah? Even there, we see a lot of potential cooperating between uh, India and Africa. Thomas, I'm going to interrupt you there and thank you for that perspective on India and Africa and thank you, Sridhar, also for the perspective on India mainly. We'll come back to you both. We have now Arup uh, Zucchi, who is the Global President and Managing Partner of Frost and Sullivan, based in San Francisco at the moment, a uh, global traveler, and with a global perspective, Arup, now. Uh, thank you, Vivek, and thanks for that generous introduction. I would, of course, like to thank uh, both Frank and uh, Vivek for giving me this opportunity. It's a both pleasure and honor to be on this uh, platform with such distinguished panel members. Uh, let me uh, put this in, in a bit of a different context, uh, more related to manufacturing, uh, and talk a little bit about 4IR and 5IR. What is the journey, what's happened so far? But very quickly, so over the last 100 years, and if you look at all the different industrial revolutions, you know, we have sequentially progressed from mechanization to electrification to automation and now digitalization, which is where we have landed today. And so if you look at 4IR, the fourth industrial revolution, you have seen the focus has been to make smarter products and solutions. And of course, the ability to leverage technology to digitize, whether it is product or services, is what is giving the business outcomes in the manufacturing ecosystem. And from a global economic standpoint, if you look at what 4IR has done to manufacturing, the estimates range anywhere between $3.5 trillion to almost $5 trillion in terms of economic impact. So the scale by far is massive. However, if you go region by region in, on the, on, at the global level, you will see there is a lukewarm impact response and adoption of these different technologies. And that is because of you know, return on investment calculations, talent and skills availability, uh, of course, government policies, geopolitical chaos, and many of the strategic imperatives that slow down the implementation of such great technologies that have now become quite common and commoditized. But at the same time, I think what's very interesting is, in a way, COVID-19 has actually induced the adoption of digital technologies. And companies that who had prepared themselves prior to this pandemic were are, are very successful in this process. And those that have not have recognized that they need to now implement these technologies very rapidly. And that's how many, many companies worldwide are putting this effort. Let me quickly talk about the difference between what 4IR is and what 5IR is. In short, the real dis dis difference between the two is in 5IR, it's all about customer experience and business model innovation. And what that means is that we'll see a lot of autonomous cyber physical production systems that will be implemented in the future. So can 4IR and 5IR work concurrently? The short answer is yes. COVID-19 allows us to do that. And is India in a perfect position to adopt this, even though there is still very early stages of uh, industrial, sorry, 4.0 IR in the system? I think the short answer is yes. And the best example I can give is when India moved from hardline phone infrastructure to mobile phone infrastructure, it took a leap in, in adoption of that technology. And I think India is very well suited for this COVID-19 to do that. Supply chains have been disrupted. Companies worldwide are looking for alternate. India is a perfect destination. And I think if Indian government, Indian business leaders pay attention to this opportunity, which is right in front of them, I think they can benefit and India could become the potential high tech, five IR based manufacturing hub for the world. Thank right, you. Arun, thank you. Thank you for that uh, very, very uh, comprehensive statement, <clears throat> which gives us a perspective. We're going to next ask uh, Mr. Ravi Chaudhary, who's a mentor to many CEOs. He's an author. He ignites leadership in organizations nowadays. 
and with his experience we look forward to hearing from him go ahead ravi thank you thank you very much i would uh, like to give a macro view 1769 james watt started the industrial revolution it initiated a new trade capitalism socialism imperialism that followed and industrialized nation that sought for foreign markets and then the revolutions that emerged from such uh, acquisitions of foreign domination and wars the governance frameworks we encounter today are the outcomes of values that shaped our character during the last four revolutions oxford philosopher toby ord in his review of what ails the world today has ranked unaligned artificial intelligence the most probable calamity ai experts now agree that singularity the point at which artificial intelligence surpasses human intelligence is not imminent it's perhaps a few decades away maybe a few centuries away it's with this recognition of limitation that people are seeking graduation from 4 ir to 5 ir so that machine intelligence can work with human intelligence the starting point of ai is that it is clever but benign but it's coldly efficient at bad stuff too governments today are aggressively applying ai to advance anti democratic regimes western companies are perfecting surveillance capitalism to monitor citizens and steer them towards targeted behaviors and lifestyles davido and melon in their new book autonomous revolution say that instead of generating productivity improvements that increase gdp and prosperity as previous revolutions have done 5 ir may boost productivity while driving down gdp among the potential results an abundance of cheaper stuff yes but also declining wages growing economic inequality less work all around and emergence of what they call millions of zevs millions of people with zero economic value individuals you wouldn't hire even if they work for free a few years of four ir have succeeded in dehumanizing humanity i'm quoting world economic forum and now the fifth industrial revolution proposes to continue that process but with humility i want to end with my firm belief that technology is morally neutral whether we steer it to serve the society or only a few at the top depends on us the leaders in business and society if we take the wrong call we'll all perish if we take the right call we'll all advance and the question is not that what we do for the poor 5 ir must focus on what we don't do for the poor and that is the vast vacuum which uh, is more talked about but less done about let's wish ourselves success that we choose the right path thank you thank you thank you ravi very advertised very clear very very clear Archish Mittal is our next speaker, and he is from the Fletcher School. He is a Raisina young fellow, and he is a young achiever, and he is at the moment in Washington D.C. So, Archish, over to you for two minutes. Uh, thank you so much, Vivek. I'll keep it very short, but thank you so much for uh, Shridhar and Arup and Thomas Wu and uh, Mr. Shaudhary to to share such amazing perspective. I'm going to keep it short, and I'm going to share my perspective as an international relations scholar and how I see the situation at the moment, and how I see India. Right. So I feel any sort of industrial revolution, be it the first, second, third, or fourth, or fifth, is only possible with human beings, and it's only possible with a diverse set of people. Right. So. uh what is happening in india i i really can't ignore it at the moment uh with the standoff and so on so i'm going to share exactly what i think and i'm going to share it very quickly so you know our prime minister has often been criticized about his foreign visits uh to foster international cooperations which i'm uh, completely uh, uh for and i think that's 
the way that uh, India should be. But uh, according to the websites of Prime Minister Modi, he's visited 60 countries occupying uh, since office he occupied in 2014, which includes over 18 visits to the neighboring countries, right? But what has happened is India has a fractured neighborhood diplomacy in South Asia, right? And uh, in last August, all our diplomatic ties were cut off from uh, from a neighbor, uh, which we've been uh, talking with uh, about in Jammu and Kashmir. And any hope whatsoever of the betterment of the Indo-Pak relation was lost right after that incident. And earlier this year, with the Citizenship Amendment Act, the National uh, Citizen Register, which caused an uprising domestically, also cut off the relationship with Bangladesh to a great extent because there was a huge uprising. And with Nepal, India has ha- always had a big brother kind of a treatment. And the pressure that we've always put on the country has put the bilateral relation to a downward trajectory as well. Seeing these blind spots in India's foreign policy in South Asia, China has always taken advantage and uh, they've invested heavily in various South Asian countries uh, and especially in the Belt and Road Initiative, including the China, China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, be it taking over the port of Sri Lanka through the debt trap, uh, debt trap diplomacy, which is widely termed as. And very recently, I don't know if, if you guys, uh, if you know what happened uh, two days back is 97% of Bangladeshi goods with enjoy duty-free access to the China market. This is what is happening in South Asia, right? So when President, uh, see, he visited India, there was a trajectory that something better is going to happen. But all that hope has gone down the drain, right? But if India really wants to grow and prosper, it has to work along with its neighbors. To capitalize on the markets, And the growing young population of India, which is primarily under 30, we need to work alongside these neighbors so that we have access to the markets. And also we have access to these manufacturing units which are located in India. So my perspective is basically very outward looking, to be honest. And I feel like I don't want to comment in a very controversial way and say what is happening in India is wrong or right. Of course, there is no nothing wrong or right. And we deserve the treatment uh, that we've worked for. But at the same time, we need to think in the long term, right? I mean, you know, the fact is, when I wanted to go and study in China international relations, I had to get a permission from Ministry of External Affairs, right? And when I was a student in school, which is uh, has to be same as uh, Mr. Vivek Atari, right? We went to the same school. I was much junior to him. The the exchange program that we had with Pakistan in the high school, that was cut off completely. The diplomatic times were cut off by the time I came to the high school, right? So what I feel like the industrial revolution is only going to happen if we work with our neighbors, and we must do that. Mm-hmm. We can work with the farthest countries in the world. We can work with the U.S., right? I'm all for the U.S. I'm in D.C. right now. We can work with any country in the world. But if you don't work with the countries which share the border with India, we are not going to go anywhere. So for me, the industrial revolution is more about working with people who surround our country, right? And winning their trust. So that's my perspective. Thank you. Thank you, Arjish. And I think a sense that I get from each of the panelists is that we need to embrace diversity, embrace humanity, embrace our neighbors, embrace all sections of society. I think that is the perspective that I would also like to bring to this forum, that uh, the industrial revolution is not a revolution at all. It has to evolve. It has to revolve around people who are from different parts of the planet, different parts of India, different parts of Africa, different parts of China and the globe. And therefore, we need to embrace each and every person going forward. I'm going to follow the same batting order that we did. I use cricket terminology. And uh, Sridhar is going to hopefully now talk about how we can exactly achieve this in Indian conditions. You spoke about migrant labor, Sridhar, and now we need to talk about how can that migrant benefit going forward from the fifth industrial revolution. It's a very good question. Uh, see, I think the, the biggest challenge we have today in India for uh, when the lockdown opened up, suddenly 
one month before the government said that if you come out of the home you will be arrested the same government is telling today that if you know it's a time to go out time to go and work that's your responsibility at the same time the migrant workers who are like somewhere struck for two months they were not allowed to go back home and uh, the government said that you have to shouldn't work now they are asked them to work <coughs> most of the areas most of uh, uh, the infrastructure projects or most of these industries where uh, low income so no, nobody is even able to get 20 30% of the resources to work so that's the biggest challenge which i see and how the how it will affect the typical labor in the overall market i'm just trying to relate but what i feel at a broader level with fourth industrial revolution and fifth industrial revolution is uh, the technology ip what you built right once you have a industry automated less number of people working and most of the things are automated so the cost arbitrage of china will lose because china got benefited because of the productivity of the labor and cost of the labor once you have more and more automation is done it's a ip led if you own the ip the cost of the production is same the us will benefit india will benefit so that's going to happen and i feel that the skill labor has to be retrained and the new areas where they can be employable and you see that the digitization is happening so fast accelerating due to covid situation this will change the kind of jobs they have to look for this is a huge amount of skill development is required by the government in the future thank you shridhar that was very well put and very succinct and to the point and thomas uh, since you have so much experience about africa i'm going to ask you how do we work with the poorer countries in africa and get them to be part of the industrial revolution and how can india also work with african countries perhaps and get uh, to to a parity amongst the nations in terms of benefit uh, thomas you're on mute i think thomas you need to unmute yeah go ahead sorry go ahead yeah um, <laughs> also Look, in response also what uh, Mr. Mitchell says, I think COVID-19 is actually a fantastic opportunity uh, in order to unite with other nations because it's a global pandemic. Yeah, at the end of the day, you know, see what we discussed today. We discuss uh, global issues, you know, on how can India, for example, cooperate with Africa, and I think there is huge opportunities. um and i would not agree totally that the fifth revolution will um will decrease the number of jobs i think it will from a global perspective actually increase significantly the jobs uh when i look at the african continent when i look at latin america south east asia you know all these countries are basically net importers but if we are leading the way into a sustainable industrialization in these continents we will create thousands and thousands of jobs sustainable jobs yeah when you see for example and I, this is always a good example in africa africa 90% of the cashew nuts worldwide are produced in africa but africa only has 8% added value on this cashew nuts the added value is partially in india partially in europe so at the end of the day uh there's only a little amount of jobs in africa yeah and the same you can go through from the agriculture to uh the healthcare to the textile industry and so on and so on and if we are responsibly investing in areas like africa south america <coughs> southeast asia i think we are going to make a, a, a another job wonder like we have seen this in uh europe or in the US or in China you know when we look at China of the 80s i always say africa is at the moment in the same phase like uh, china in the 80s it was a poor country it had hardly any industrial jobs 
you know, and uh, it was moving then in the 90s slowly, and only by entering WTO in 2001, China actually uh, grew much faster, and, see, and today we see the strength of China. Africa is exactly at the same time like China in, in the end of the 80s. You know, it is still a continent with a lot of um, uh, potential. The market has developed, has to develop, uh, and skills have to be developed. But at the end of the day, it is uh, uh, it is jumping into the 90s of China, where we see first job creations. And uh, I think it is our responsibility to do this sustainable. The other As thing well, I'm going to pause you, Thomas. I'll come back to you again. Thank yeah. you for that uh, wonderful comment. I'm going to move to Arup uh, because, Arup, uh, I want to ask you two things. One, Lawrence is asking a question from the audience that what exactly do you mean by 5IR? He says that in Japan we have society 5.0, in Germany we have industry 4.0. So what is 5IR in a nutshell? And also, Arup, I want to ask you how do large organizations like Frost & Sullivan, which you had, or other companies, work with governments and NGOs across the world to make a real change going forward. Aru. Yes. Uh, thank you, Vivek. So in a nutshell, at a very broad level, the difference between 4IR and 5IR is around, of course, technologies. And we heard about AI, machine learning, etc., which have now become quite popular. Those are uh, elements that are now coming into 5IR, which was not in 4IR. But I think the biggest difference is the business model innovation that you see in 5IR, which is not possible in 4IR, and also customer experience. In addition to that, within the business model innovation, as in the past, we were focused on products and services. We then moved on to solutions. In 5IR, we'll focus on outcome as a service. And that means if you deliver an outcome, that's what you will get paid for. And that's the future, in my opinion. That's the big difference. And Society 5.0 that we see in Japan it builds these elements of mass customization and personalization because more and more people would like to get a product that is more personalized for their consumption. And that's right. where Society 5.0 comes in and 5IR enables that and makes it happen. So that's a quick a top level view of that. How do we work with governments and, and NGOs and other corporations worldwide is exactly around how digital technologies can help accelerate the economic transformations in countries. And we talked about our neighbors, and I can very proudly say that my organization has been very actively involved with the government of Nepal, and we have instituted the Digital Nepal Framework. And what that basically means is across all the sectors of the economy, we are digitizing the business from agri-tech to tourism to, of course, cloud and other types of technologies as well. So, but one of the underlying phenomena to make this happen is to ensure that the entire country has access to good technology, good bandwidth, good internet connection. And we know even in a country like India, even though we have very high penetration of mobile technology, we're still far from getting to that level of, of high bandwidth. So before our session, we talked about maybe we should make internet a fundamental right, make internet accessible and available and affordable to a larger audience. I think all of that will help economic transformation for countries and thereby improve the quality of living, the human lives, and of course, make the country a lot more stable. So that's how we have worked with countries worldwide. Thank you, Arup. I'm very, very impressed with the panel. They are sharp and their observations are absolutely to the point. Uh, Ravi, sir, I'm going to go with you and ask you about the human way required going forward, the leadership skills required, other skills required. What kinds of human beings do we need uh, going forward? Uh, great question. Thank you, Ray. You know, revolutions happen when people have a clear objective. Now, leadership hereafter, if they want to use fifth industrial development to create a revolution that is sustainable, then the main objective has to be human progress for all, 
not profit for a few. If profit is the driver, then no revolution will last long. Now, somehow, leaders have to start imagining and actualizing the potential of technology from the perspective of the bottom 70% of the population, the poor, the farmers, the factory workers, the unskilled labor, the rural people. In fact, I have often mentioned that if you want a good measure of sustainable development goals, measure the growth of GDP of the bottom 70% of the population in each country, and you will then know if SDGs are on track. Look at smart cities. In fact, the question often asked is smart for whom and cities for whom? The global the studies have often revealed that in a country like India, smart cities never benefit more than 3 to 5% of the population of any city. And the rest are just watchers and helpless uh, uh, contributors uh, to how others can succeed. So I think eventually, we have to break the invisible walls in our minds and start doing leadership from the heart, a new heart set, and relate to the poor who have been so long been deprived of the benefits of technology all over the world. Wonderfully well said and uh, so true. I totally agree with you on the human uh, qualities needed. Hey, uh, Archish, there's a question from the audience for you, which I will pose to you now. It's Ayush Agarwal asking you that while agreeing that we should have strong bilateral trade with neighbors, do you feel that decisions related to the sovereignty of the state should be given a priority below the economic interest of the country? So it's a little high uh, flying, but uh, I'm sure you understand the gist. Yeah, absolutely. I do. Uh, so thank you so much for, for the question. And Thank you so much, Mr. Zuchi and Mr. Chaudhary. I feel like you guys have pretty much covered everything that was there to talk about. But so, you know, when I started studying uh, at the Fletcher School of Diplomacy and uh, being in the Raisana Fellow at the Observer Research Foundation, I realized one thing that for me, all the conflicts that have happened in the past in the world, not just with India, but anyone is a Wikipedia page. That's what it is. Right. And that is my generation. But what we can do looking forward is think about the bigger picture and the long term vision of what we have about the world. Right. Sovereignty, freedom, independence, bilateral trade. These are all very big words for me. Right. I don't understand that. But what I understand uh, studying international relations is that every country, every person involved is actually a human being, as most of the elite panelists uh, already mentioned. And what do we need to do in this situation is embrace the other person, whatever nationality, ethnicity, or country they belong to. You know why? Because 50 years down the line, whatever conflict happens today, or it happened tomorrow, or it will, it happened yesterday, it won't exist anymore. But what will exist is us. We are the people who are going to be in this world in the next 50 years. And the onus is on us on how we want to take it forward. Do we want to work together? Do we want to have bilateral trade relations, uh, relationships? Do we want to make the fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth industrial revolu uh, revolutionization? Or we want to be stuck back in the past of what happened 50, 100 years back, right? So for me, all these words, Ayush, that you mentioned here, um, they're very big. I don't know what sovereignty is. I really don't know what bilateral trade is, to be honest. But what I understand is that I see that I'm going to be alive in this world 50 years from now. And today what I can do is I can make an effort every day of my life to work with my neighbors, work with the countries around the world and be a global citizen. And I think that is something that uh, the generation of, of my time uh, needs to think about is we need to think about making action today, which will have implications in the future. So I don't know if that answers the question for Ayush. I think Artush, we get the point absolutely well said. And we get the point absolutely. 
So uh, I'm just going to uh, uh, just mention that uh, we have a panel which is uh, so diverse in its own makeup and probably represents, I wouldn't say the whole of the world, but definitely different sections of society and industry and the thinking. And uh, being from the government background, we also have government, uh, ex-government here in my uh, presentation. So I'm also going to say that, um, let's say that uh, Sridhar spoke more about the common man in India, how COVID is going to impact, how the government needs to make sure that the commonest of the common is benefiting. And uh, Thomas has been uh, very insightful in mentioning how African countries need to be on the bandwagon to progress as well and how his team is doing great research in COVID as, uh, as well as other uh, aspects of uh, medicine and uh, research. He also heard from uh, Arup about leadership of uh, global enterprises and how uh, it is possible for a large organization to work with a small company or even otherwise. And uh, while I see the time up message is about to come, I'm going to uh, just quickly say that from Ravi, we heard uh, leadership quality is needed and why we should embrace all kinds of diversity. And going forward, it is the human being which matters, which is pretty much what Archish also added to. And it is not uh, just today which matters. It is tomorrow which matters. It is the next 50 years which matter. We need to think globally. We need to think of sustainable development goals. We need to think of equity. So, gentlemen, this is the last over now, and we have uh, two sentences each uh, possible, uh, given the time uh, available. So I'm going to request you to restrict yourself to two sentences each and wrap up your thoughts. Sridhar first. We are on mute. Uh, Sridhar, unmute. Yeah. Please unmute yourself. All of you. Yeah. Go ahead. Two sentences. And we, talk, we spoke about fifth industrial revolution, you know, is it good for the society, you know, what should be done? I feel that it's not artificial intelligence, it's an augmented intelligence. So any technology, you know, readiness of the technology to implementation will take four to five years. Same way how you use the technology for the good also will be evolved. You know, that's where, you know, you're working with somebody like World Economic Forum, where the industry and the government come together all over the world and come make the government policy for the good of the world is what is necessary. Thank you, Sridhar. Over to you, Thomas, for two last sentences. I think the global challenges like uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, but also we should not forget uh, the climate change will unite the globe and will uh, change the mindset of the leaders in order to invest more sustainable, work together and fight these challenges uh, together, independently I from both interests. And I think <laughs> this is making me hopeful the globe will develop in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Yes, Aru. Yes, thanks, sir, Vic. Uh, my message to the audience and, of course, to the business leaders in India is invest in your future. Uh, I would recommend uh, focus on technologies that will be enablers. I think there is a golden opportunity India has given what's happened uh, because of COVID-19. I would say make manufacturing a cool uh, area for people to build their careers. It's not at this time. Make it cool, reward people, pay people what is required and get that whole machinery moving with some skills training and I think India can become a massive player in the global supply chain and manufacturing. Thank you, Arup. Ravi? Uh, life uh, is not about having more, but being more. That's right. why we are called human beings, not human having. Let's uh, use technology to be more rather than amass more wealth. Creating progress for all, not just for a few. Wonderful, Ravi. Archish, you have only one sentence. Go ahead. Uh, be the heart of global citizenship. It's not really about the industrial revolution. It's about the human revolution within. Thank you. I think this is a wonderful panel. We have 20 seconds left for me to say that uh, we should embrace technology. We should embrace humanity. We should embrace diversity going forward. This industrial revolution has to make a real change to the happiness 
of people across the world. Thank you all for watching and thank you for being a part of this. And thank you, Vivek, for doing a great job. Yeah. Thank you, thank Vivek. You. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much. We can stay on for a couple of minutes, uh, gentlemen. Uh, I think we are not live anymore. We are live still, but uh, we, we can probably close with some pleasantries. Thank you all for watching and thank you all for being a part of this. It's really a pleasure. Let's stay connected and thank you, Horace, for hosting us and having us speak here. Uh, I think there's a possibility of a group photograph here uh, for some reason. Will you all smile? Virtual group fee coming up. Uh, yeah, I think we got it. Wait one more minute, one more minute. Okay. Uh, can you see this? Do you see the button on the right? I don't know if it's Go working. LP, yeah. Go LP. Yeah, smile. Okay. Let's see if it comes. I think we got it. All right then, gentlemen, we'll stay connected. All of you, Ravi, we'll meet up in Delhi. Yeah, look forward to it. <laughs> I oh, thank you very much. Thanks for meeting up sometime. Shridhar also. And Thomas, please come to India and meet us. Likewise, anybody coming to the Bay Area, let me know. The last two minutes were really bad. I could not hear you guys at all. But uh, it was a great session, in case you hear me. Okay, we could hear you. It was very good. You were very good, Thomas. All the best to you. Keep smiling. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.